fact, it was in the 27th of August, 1859. That was just about the end of the herring fishing season and week at that time. Week, I should say, then was the premier herring port in Scotland. It was exporting a third of all the herring I get out of Scotland was going out a week. And it attracted something like three to four, sometimes even 5,000 people for the West. Now, by the West and week, we mean the mainland and the Western Isles. So all the fishermen going out a week at a time, something like a total or maybe a quarter of them or slightly less would be what we would call healing men for the way. And they had come a week by its time for 60 years and there had never ever been any trouble. However, on this particular day it was a Saturday night. Now it was the custom for the healing men because it wasn't long after the disruption and you know back with fundamental religion and a free kirk was sort of taking up its grip on it. They used to go to prayer meetings in preparation for his services the following day. And 1,500 of them was at one prayer meeting in week. It was the largest Gaelic-speaking congregation the world has ever seen were, were in week. But at least something like two to 3,000 other people, because the boats had all been tidied up, everything was finished for a weekend, and it was a custom then just to walk through the streets. And the market square in week was a magnet, of course, for people, for you could see Freen's Fell right place, and it also had a lot of stalls and booths. Irish ragmen, all that kind of people were up with, usually rubbish that they were selling to people, you see. They'd all a fancy patter for the suit, but they didn't realise that most of the folk they were selling to couldn't speak English anyway. It, was, it must have been quite funny, but it all a fancy patter for something that could not speak only Gaelic. But anyway, that didn't deter them, they still did it. And among the crowd that was doing there was this boy, Phil Lewis. He was about 11 years old, 11 or 12 years old, just maybe 12, because he was likely around with his father out of fishing, that's likely why he was in week. And he had bought an orange by one of these stalls and booths. And he was crossing the road and he let it fall. And it fell and rolled to the feet of a boy at the long week, we think partly to him, but the boy was slightly bigger older, 14 or 15, and he lifted up the orange and he wouldn't get back. And of course, the boy had dropped the orange, Fay Lewis, asked some two people at Kent to help him to get the orange back and of course the man he spoke with the one of them was slightly drunk and in taking the orange back for the boy for the week he struck him I don't think it was a hard scale but he struck him anyway and just like wildfire fechting broke with just clear across the market square they reckon that within a two minutes 300 men were fechting in the market square for no reason at all they started breaking up the booths and for using bits of wood that they were made for for weapons and clubs and whatever and it was just a raging torrent. Now, Week's Polish station at that time was only about 100 yards away anyway. And somebody obviously had run to get help. So a Polish arrived, or one Polishman arrived, in about 10 minutes. And that had the effect. It, just, it shows you respect that people had then for law and order. The arrival of one Polishman stopped 300 people for fechting. But he arrested a man, for Lewis, for hitting the boy. And he took him back to the Polish station. Whereupon, the crowd became very aggressive and hostile because they were saying, well, it wasn't this man's fault in the first place. The word had now spread that an innocent man had been arrested or whatever. And soon, there was a mob besieging a Polish station to get him out. And there was about 3,000, 2,000, 3,000, nobody knows, but 2,000, 3,000 people in the street. But of that, there was about a hardcore or hundred that were bent in trouble. The rest were just spectators, really, to see what was going on. Now, the Polish inside, seeing that the, the mood of the besiegers was getting ugly, sent out for their reinforcements. Well, the whole Polish force was only three anyway, but they had a lot of special constables that could be called up, so they were sent for, and ten of them arrived, and Pontletoon had a separate Polish force at that time. It was three, so it was summoned and all. So, in terms, you know, sending for reinforcements of three to fight a mob of 3,000, but this is what was coming. Anyway... The mob outside was getting ferocious, and one of them, and he was the... Now, I'm not sure if he's the grandfather. I think he would probably be the great-grandfather of the late Donnie B. McLeod, a, a broadcaster. It was, I think it was his great-grandfather. Anyway, he was one of them. He went and got a boat's mast to try and smash down the door of the police station and get this man out. Just about the same time, a specials had arrived, and they hadn't even got their uniforms on. They hadn't attempted the uniforms. They were all rushed down because mayhem seemed to be running riot in the middle of the town. And they grabbed, now again, I'm not sure which one it was, but they grabbed one of the ringleaders, whether it was Donnie's great-grandfather or no, I don't know, but they grabbed them. And, of course, the crowd hung on his other ear, trying to stop him from being arrested. And in the process, his 
clothes were all torn off and he was hauled into jail, needle naked as they say. So now there were two innocent men in the jail and the crowd was getting wilder and wilder and wilder. Stones began to get thrown in and out of the child yard and they were besieging it and frantic messages were sent. There was a fish cruiser lying in St. Bay. Somehow they got a messenger out through the crowd, he galloped off Lackergo, signalled the ship to send a detachment of blue chickens, but of course it took hours for them to come. Meanwhile, more specials had been aroused and they'd appeared and there should be a sort of stalemate for a while. Now the ringleaders of the S. Hunter was the real agitators, withdrew now across the bridge to get out the other side of the river, across the bridge. But what was bothering everybody was, there were still 1,500 healing men in this prayer meeting. And what was going to happen when they came out, you see? So they sent an urgent messenger round till the minister that was addressing it, saying, for heaven's sake, tell everybody to go straight home. Don't come down to the bridge at all. Go right home. Because if they came down, that would swell the crowd about four or five thousand. And against this, you've got about four or five regular policemen and ten specials and the messenger at arms and the sheriff clerk or whoever it was because they tuned council, they hadn't got them rounded up yet, we'll see what's happening. Anyway, the minister, Joaquin Fatung, the Reverend Mackay Fatung, he spoke to the congregation and they all agreed that they would go home, and they did, fortunately, and they went home, and uh, the minister himself then came across, and they got two or three other Gaelic speakers that hadn't taken part in the plan, plead with crowd, go home, and that would be a trial on Monday, and if these men were innocent, they'd be let go and all that. So anyway, they did go, but this bunch of healing men going across a, a brig that were now said the brig hadn't heard any of us, they didn't know. So then they decided to charge, they came charging back across the brig and they were met, because we had the old Telford Humphrey back at brig at that time, and the police and they met head on in the middle end, and everybody was laying out everybody else with sticks or whatever else they could fin. And a pitched battle they stayed there for, well, till it got dark anyway, dark and fell, and they were still in the middle of gloom, and they then a policeman retreated, and both sides retreated to sort of regroup like should ever see what happened. Darkness had fallen, so a Polish best and more volunteers had sort of come forward and they decided to systematically clear the streets. And the policemen did that on what we call the weak side of the river and then eventually the healing on the other side of the river dispersed back to their lodgings, which was in Pontley side, on their side of the river anyway. Sunday was a day of great tension I and mean, I believe it was just electric, the atmosphere, because these two men were still in the child, you see. Nobody knew whether there was going to be another attempt to release them or no. And there were emergency meetings with Toon Council held the whole day for what we were going to do. And everybody was persuaded anyway that this wasn't the end of the affair, whatever else, because they had to have a trial now. And the trial was set for Monday morning. So they decided to send a message to Edinburgh. Now at that time, a telegraph system had only got as far as Helmsdale. It had not got the week. So a rider had to be sent for a week to Helmsdale. And then a message sent to Edinburgh to send up reinforcements in case of trouble. But of course there was no hope of that being there by Monday morning, but they expected the trouble going a bit. Now on Monday no boats went to sea. Normally there would be, at that time, nearly 900 or 1,000 boats going to sea a week. Not one loused a rope, because the trial was on. The trial was set for 10 o'clock on Monday morning, but as early as 7 o'clock on Monday morning, the agitators for the previous Saturday night were all gathering in the town, determined that they were still going to rescue them. A musky Local authorities were due, they didn't panic or anything, in spite of all those huge numbers. They held an emergency meeting and they decided the best thing to do to take hate the situation was release them on bail. Don't try them and find them guilty, but by time, until such time as the army and the navy got here, release them on bail without charging them at all. And that's what they did. Not only was that quite a clever move, because it would have been physically impossible for them to have got them into the courtroom anyway, because they'd completely besieged the street. It was impossible to make your way through with people surrounded it, determined that they weren't going to come to try. So they released them and the boats went back to sea. Now, nothing much happened until the following Saturday. And in the meantime, on the Thursday, a shipload of Yorkshire Light Infantry came, a hundred men for them, and some blue jackets of uh, naval ships came as well. But on Saturday day now, the following Saturday, everything seemed to have calmed down. And he Toon had mounted sort of foot patrols to go in and see if there was no trouble in the streets. And a gang of youths by Pontletoon had formed up down at the harbour, and they had been throwing stones at healing men that were in their boats, you see, maybe tidying up the boats. And then this mob, there was about 15 or 20 of them, decided to run through Pontletoon, where most of the healing men were in the street. And, of course, they were making noise and shouting, and a lot of people, healing men that were lodging in, came to the door to see, 
Six and eleven people were stabbed by this mob. Absolutely, totally innocent people. They had nothing whatsoever to do with anything. It's immediately electrified the whole atmosphere again, which was beginning to relax as a result. The news of this appalling uh, uh, crime spread through to like wildfire, and several people were very badly injured indeed. The perpetrators, of course, vanished, although they did get them eventually. And a navy was called out, immediately in double order all rushed through the tune and took up strategic positions to stop any reaction coming by the alien people. But what again defused the situation was the fact that the local people, the Uyghurs, were so appalled at what these boys had done that they all rushed the assistance and help of the people that had been stabbed. And nobody died. And again, as great good luck would have it, two of the tune's doctors happened to be in the area attending the other people. And they were able to staunch the bleeding, you know, and, and, and staunch your wounds, and nobody died as a result. Now, again, immediately, rioting broke out. When I say rioting, face, I would say more than rioting, because it never got widespread, but there were tit-for-tat battles broke out, and a pub was wrecked, and stacks were going, all sorts of things. But uh, nothing very serious. They contained the whole situation. And on Monday morning, the town council of the week immediately posted a reward of £25 for information, shalom on it, leading to the apprehension of the people that had done the stabbing. And of course, eh, leaders of the healing, or spokesmen for healing community were greatly reassured by this, that the population in week generally, and the town council in particular, were really as distressed as they were about what had happened, and really meant business. And they eventually did arrest one man, and he was in prison for it. The healing men that year went home early, they went home about, the whole fleet went home about three weeks earlier than they should have as a result of it. But of course the authorities still pursued the matter of the rioter that had been arrested in the Saturday before that. They, they still pursued him as far as Lewis, and sheriff's officers went with a warrant to Lewis to arrest him. But they never got him. They never got him. And that was how the episode sort of died down. But it could have been extremely dangerous.